felt a little bit like George Bush. I know this remember the time I was endorsing the candidates of the old jig outside the White House. Anyhow, I'm so glad to be here at the AESD conference and to see so many familiar faces here in the audience as well. Um, I had the privilege to actually be on a panel, uh, I believe it was almost exactly one year ago, at Bellevue. And um, then I had the chance to speak at the AESA conference in Colorado, so I know some of you from either one of those, and now I'm here today. So it's so nice to be in this familiar group. And I actually still have, all around our house, we have those green coasters. How many of you were at Bellevue or, and have those green coasters remind you of this conference? But you know what I'm talking about. So uh, I'm really excited to be speaking to such an amazing group of people. Now, actually, I'm connected to the conference in more ways than one. Dr. Yong Zhao, who you heard this morning, uh, was a college classmate of my mom's back at the Sichuan Institute of Foreign Languages, so it's like uh, small world moments everywhere. And uh, now my mom pointed out quite rightly that she studied French and he studied English and he got to be on stage. So, <laughs> I don't know what that says about studying French versus English, but then she added, I have a kid on stage. Why? <laughs> okay, no, that was horrible. I don't much at all. But to get back on track, you might have seen the title, The Road Ahead for the Student of Tomorrow. Now, I really consider myself quite a fan of history. It's one of my favorite subjects in school. And as a history at UMT, I always look behind me when I think about the road ahead. I'm not sure if that's a good thing when I'm walking down the street and I crash into something, but it's always a good thing when I'm thinking about education. Now to start off with my own experience, with my educational past, I'm glad that I didn't go to school for 10 years. Now you might be thinking, she didn't go to school for 10 years? Uh, what's with that? Well, when I was three years old, this is a image of me when I was three years old. Um, actually, all three of those are, you can probably tell who I am. Um, and I selected the more adorable ones, the rest. Maybe I have I some need to throw tantrums, learn, right? But when I was three years old, one of the things that I was doing, aside from throwing tantrums occasionally, was reading chapter books. I love reading books. I read, you know, I tried to read a book every day. In fact, when I went to the library and I was very young, I was just toddling around and I grabbed a book off the shelf. It was a super hard book, and my mom looked at me and was like, You can't read that. And I said, No, watch me. And I started reading it. And she was like, Okay, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> and so, as a three year old reading chapter books, um, my parents figured that it might be a little redundant to send me to preschool where I would be learning my alphabet and working story that my desire to, be, to learn would be stifled by boredom. So instead, they decided to set up a small school group in the home. So I guess uh, at that time, I was fitting right into this side of the new school. And we had tutors who would come help us and also neighborhood kids who joined us. And this was actually uh, kind of a a great double-edged thing because not only did we have that socialization aspect that a lot of times people say homeschool kids miss out on, we also um, got to lower the cost of private tutors. So economics too. And this was all supplemented by taking classes at my school district's um, homeschooling resource center. There we are over there. And I had the chance to do a lot of creative writing at this time. I was in a creative writing class at three, four years old, sitting alongside kids who were sometimes five, six, seven years older than me. And it was a great experience, I have to say. Um, and I also got to do lots of drawing. You can see some of the creative work back there. Because, again, my parents didn't believe in the drill and kill, OK, you have to learn everything by memorization and spend 24 hours a day learning um, really hardcore stuff. It was, you know, you have the freedom to play. You have the freedom to draw and write. Really do whatever strikes your interest as well as learning the basics. And I'm really glad that I had this freedom at an early age because Contrary to what you might think, it didn't hinder my education at all. It really helped me. Because while my peers were doing goblin worksheets, I got to do things like write poems and stories. And that's what really allowed me to be the writer um, that I am today. Now our teachers, none of them certified, all recent graduates from college and some still in college, were incredibly passionate about their subjects and taught us about interesting things, everything from Mexican revolutionaries to art history to human anatomy. This is not the type of thing that you would usually find in a classroom for a seven-year-old, eight-year-old. And my mom wasn't particularly concerned about the sequence of our learning, which is a little bit unusual, but she said, you know, just go with what you're passionate about and try to make sure that passion comes to the kids. And that was something really important, I think, in my early education, because I had a chance to work with teachers who cared deeply about what they were teaching. 
Through our close connection with our tutors, we became as excited about the subjects as they did. So my sister and I were telling stories about Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata, the Mexican revolutionaries, um, right alongside George Washington and Alexander Hamilton. And we really got that global view of education. Um, and I think that when people talk about the new school model, there's a word that we hear quite a lot, which is customization. How do we customize for diverse learners? Um, the audio keeps on cutting in and out, but... Want to try a new battery? Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> School, then we definitely had a lot of customization going on because tutors worked with us so closely. And when my mom realized that our math skills needed some work, we started doing mental math for fun, uh, in, in kind of in games, and that made it a lot easier for all of us. We wrote a lot every single day. And instead of learning SAT vocabulary words with flashcards, we would write poetry to represent a word and then share it with our classmates and try to have them guess what the word meant. So it was really fun all around. Best of all, if we didn't like something, we had no qualms about complaining to the principal because she was our mom, after all. <laughs> there was a lot of feedback going on in all directions. Our tutors to us, us to our mom, us to our tutors. And I felt like we were really partners in this community of learning. I felt occasionally even that tutors were learning something from me, which I think was an amazing thing for a seven-year-old to be able to feel that adults can learn from young people as well. Now, my mom, because of how closely she worked with the tutors, didn't really set in place this permanent curriculum, you need to learn this by this date. And they just would submit lesson plans, and she would look at them, and we were really the center of those plans. Now fast forward a few years, and our seemingly perfect little school starts to dissolve when we move from Renton to Redmond. I don't know what it is about Redmond, but uh, that's going to happen. And my older sister, Adriana, decided to try out public school in seventh grade to see how she liked it. And I started taking online public school courses as well to accommodate my increasingly busy travel schedule. Today, I'm duly enrolled in Washington Virtual Academy and Redmond High School, brick and mortar school, and online school respectively. And it's an arrangement that I have to admit can be a little difficult at times to mesh with my extracurriculars. You see, although I've spent less hours sitting in a classroom than an average student, I've been in more classrooms than probably any of my peers. About over 500 schools and classrooms now, whether through video conferencing or visits in person, for my unusual extracurriculars, which are delivering speeches and teaching other students about reading, writing, leadership, and other topics. So how does a 14-year-old get started on a path of teaching? Well, funnily enough, considering that I'm talking about model for a new school, my aspirations for teaching started in a decidedly old school place. Raise your hand if you've read Little House on the Prairie. I've seen a lot of raised hands. Why have no guys read Little House on the Prairie? This, this continually astounds me. Uh, now, Little House on the Prairie held a very special place in my heart. It occupied this shrine-like place on my bookshelf. I had all eight books, um, and I wanted to be a pioneer, just like Laura. This is my Halloween costume a year ago, so you can see it's still, still there. And I would go for the bonnet and the braids and the hoop skirt dress because of what it, it was such. Um, I, I was such a big fan of Little House on the Prairie. Now, there was another thing that I saw more at Mills Wilder, and that was that she became a teacher in these happy golden years, which is the last book in the series. Then she goes and she teaches in this rural one-room schoolhouse, and it talks about her trials and tribulations as she proves herself to the students. And I found something so romantic about this image of teaching as it was portrayed in Little House on the Prairie, the whole one-room schoolhouse, the reaching out to students. And I, loving this book, wanted to become a teacher myself. Now, this was a somewhat strange career choice at seven years of age. A lot of seven-year-olds probably say that they want to be various things, but you might not think that they'll follow through with it in a few years. Young people don't seem to tend toward teaching automatically or culturally. If you get together a group of 10-year-olds or 14-year-olds and you ask them, what do you want to become when you grow up? You might hear some astronauts, you might hear some scientists or doctors, or maybe some elephants if they've still got that spark of creativity. But unfortunately, you don't hear teacher a whole lot, at least in my experience. And actually, the Chinese word for teacher, which I've drawn really badly here, excuse my um, horrible Chinese character writing, the Chinese word for teacher, laoshe, actually means old master, literally. So to be a young old master is somewhat incongruous. 
But I got the opportunity to be exactly that a little sooner than I had expected. Because along with my quite comprehensive list of potential careers, I wanted to be a writer. Now, when I was five, six years old, I loved reading and writing so much that the idea that there could be people in the world who didn't like to read and write just seemed completely foreign to me. And never quite entered my mind that that could be possible. So when someone said in this nonchalant tone, I don't really like to read and write that much, I was like, what? You shattered my world. Not quite, not tone of voice. But it actually sparked a real journey for me, a journey to speak to other students about reading and writing, why I loved it so much, and to really try to show them the lively side of what reading and writing can be. It doesn't just need to be seemingly boring things that you do for school. It can be something you do for fun. It can be something that you do all the time. And I really started my teaching as a result of that experience and that spark. I learned a lot over the course of this journey about what it means to be a teacher and a learner and about how to integrate technology into education. And through this unique role as teacher and student across many mediums, both in person and online, small homeschool and large public school, I found that increasingly the diversity of our students and the wealth of information that we have at our fingertips necessitates a new school model where learning really is customized for every student. In the olden days, wealthy families hired governesses and tutors, tutors like Aristotle for Alexander the Great, and customization happened naturally. So while I know it's not super realistic to ask that we give every student their own Aristotle, I think that we should aspire to build a new school model where every student can become one. Because being able to question, think deeply, and have an impact, the things that a great philosopher like Aristotle did, are things which will empower us in the 21st century. Creating this new school model demands awareness of what youth are doing online, youth digital culture and its role in our education, actively involving student voice, and meaningfully implementing technology. So starting off with the youth digital culture aspect, to understand the new model of school, it's also important to understand how we learn and play online. So let's start with a little multiple choice pop quiz. Raise your hand to vote on the meaning of FDW. A, feed the world, B, for the win, C, forget the word, D, finish the word. Who thinks it's A? Raise your hand if you think it's A. Raise your hand if you think it's B. Okay. Raise your hand if you think it's C. And raise your hand if you think it's D. Wow, I'm seeing a lot of wrong answers. It's actually <laughs> B, for the win. And this is really ubiquitous. If you're friends with teenagers, who is friends with a lot of teenagers on social networks? I've seen some raised hands. Very well, I'm friends with a lot of teenagers, but you felt that if you ever see uh, someone probably under the age of 18 saying, um, uh, trying to give an example, okay, rocking out with ESD superintendents, FTW, for the win. So it's a positive thing when you're expressing, yay, really like this. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> I had tested my parents on it, and they didn't know what it was either, so I'm not sure what the cutoff age for FTW is. <laughs> Don't feel too out of ourselves. Okay, does anyone here know what YOLO means? YOLO. Okay, anyone want to take a guess? Maybe you'll actually hit YOLO. <laughs> And you wonder why students don't raise their hands so <laughs> Okay, fine, because apparently nobody here is visionary and risk-taking. Um, YOLO means you only live once. And it's used quite a lot on social networks. It's become something of this meme that has just really gone viral. So people will say YOLO in all kinds of situations, like skydiving because YOLO. And it's like, well, it seems like that reason this guy died, but YOLO is everywhere. Uh, I saw someone who posted a picture of a cat jumping and they put YOL nine times, which I thought was an interesting thing on it. And then there was also the, um, there was an Indian version which was, can't say YOLO, believe in reincarnation, which I thought was really funny. So there's all kinds of takes on YOLO and across social networking. Does anyone know what this meme is called? Anyone seen it? Has anyone seen it before? You see some raised hands. Okay, so this is a troll face meme. And I don't know why people post this all the time, but for some reason people love using this whenever someone says something on Facebook, someone will post the image as a reaction to something that was said. It's obviously expressing, I can't even tell what it's expressing. Actually, it's bad, whatever it's expressing. <laughs> now, when I tried to explain this world to my parents, 
they're a little bit confused usually because this is a world that generally is restricted to the under 18 crowd. And in fact, when my mom said to Femme, like, what do you mean when you said that your parents don't understand MEMS? What is a MEMS? <laughs> I'm going to prove my point. So, meme comes from, uh, it's pronounced meme. I looked this up to make sure. I heard a lot of people pronounce it incorrectly, like meme and meme. I don't know where that comes from. But meme um, comes from the word gene, and it's used to describe something that spreads virally over social networks. Um, could be an image, could be an image of text, whatever it is. So, it's memes like troll face, YOLO, FTW, that are instantly recognizable to most of my Facebook friends. Whether we're looking at creating and sharing memes, watching YouTube videos or making them, reading celebrities' tumblers, that's a blog that you can update from various sources, or becoming YouTube stars, we aren't sitting back and waiting for adults to tell us what to watch or what to make or read. So what is the lesson here for education as we strive to build a new school? Well, my thought was what if we could make learning as viral and social and enjoyable as memes on Facebook or videos on YouTube? What if we could use the connections of the online world to bring students closer to their schools and to their educators? Well, one thing I realize as you're listening to this, is you might be thinking, oh, well, social networking is just all about socializing. It doesn't really have patients for education. Well, yes, social networking is for socializing, not education um, primarily. But there are many cases where students are using Facebook to chat with their friends, ask for help. And across the nation, there are various groups set up um, could be AP classes, really could be any class, where students all in one class will set up a group and talk about homework and how to study for the test and, yeah, occasionally complain about the teacher because this is a virtual study hall. So, oh, should I yeah, try to if you want to understand youth digital culture a little bit more than just watching a couple of the channels that young people tune into, or maybe looking for examples of, say, a group dedicated to sport, for those of you who have children, like probably teenagers around my age who are on Facebook, they might be familiar with this sort of trend of setting up a group to talk with your classmates, almost like a virtual study hall. So this is an example from my AP Art History class and also from um, my biology class. And so people are talking about what the homework was and what it's due, as well as other things. And it's a really interesting use of Facebook because usually you think Facebook, okay, it's just where people post pictures of their cats and talk about what they did today and things like that, but it can actually be adapted really easily for an educational purpose, and that's what students are doing every day. But much as I love these groups and use them quite often for help on my homework, it's still a relatively shallow use of online technology compared with the possibility that we have for online projects to give students more purpose in learning. This, to me, uh, and to many of my peers as well, is probably one of the most pressing issues about our education, which is that we don't have enough purpose in what we do every day. The most important foundation of a new school is one where all students feel purpose in their learning. Purpose in learning can be found in a lot of school districts' mission statements, but I see that it's fairly achieved because you may remember what Dr. Jung Jao said earlier, which is that students do work that is for the most part meaningless for 12 years. The purpose in work doesn't necessarily need to be, I'll use it every day in my job. I mean, I study geometry because I want to be able to understand the world around me better, not because I'm realistically going to be using various geometry formulas when I grow up, but we rarely give students the opportunity to directly see connections between something they learn and how something in the world works, or an interesting fact that they learn in US history, how it affects politics today. We need to make more of these connections to show purpose and real world impact. When the answer to why are we doing this schoolwork is an unsatisfactory because it'll be on the test on Friday or because you'll need it later, later meaning years from now or quite possibly never, students can tune out and become disengaged. We need better reasons. If school is supposed to be preparation for life, then school as I know it is preparing me for an awfully strange life, one that consists of bubbling tests and a big project worth 200 points every few months. You and I know that life isn't like that. Life is about discovery and learning and amazement and wonder and, yeah, sometimes dealing with crises, but no crisis ever handed you a bubble in form with A through E options. So we know the problem, which is that very rarely do students get the chance to put something we've learned into action in the real world or see a way in which something we learn on paper shapes the world around us. I would love if more of the projects I embarked on allowed me to see visible good happening in the community. What we do to help the world is usually, like in my case, extracurricular, but this is something that I think we can change 
fairly rapidly with technology. I recently participated in something called the National Education Startup Challenge, or NESC, which was launched by the Department of Education, and it asked students across grade levels to submit ideas for addressing important issues in education, like for instance, getting students to graduate, or the skills gap, um, how students are graduating lacking skills for college and career. So what we came up with, um, my friends Priya and Maya and I, we worked on this, it was called Application for the Future. And it was this hypothetical program that would be in some schools where students would work with mentors from technology fields like Microsoft, Google, Nintendo, other companies. And they would work on developing an app for a phone that would be creative, that would be different, and that would allow people to uh, really see something interesting coming out of students as opposed to just a piece of paper given to a teacher, one person to read and evaluate. And it would address writing, reading, STEM skills, all the different things. So we, um, you know, we were plugging this to the Department of Education. So we're like, yeah, it addresses common core standards. <laughs> and this is, we ha also have this nice little slogan, bridge the gap, build an app. Gap, addressing the skills gap. And here's the video pitch so you can take a look. Um, I act someone here. Um, if you're wondering why I have a thinking, okay, well, it's buffering. So while this entry is hypothetical, I would love to see a program that really allows students to produce something tangible and put it on the market or make it available to people and see results. Seeing something that we've done actually happen authentically. They said that I didn't have the technology skills I needed I didn't have to act Now there's an app for that. Application for the future. This innovative new startup provides students in underserved school districts with the unique opportunity to build 21st century skills through designing an app. Working in teams of five with expert volunteer mentors from technology fields, students will refine their products to bring to a larger audience at the Consumer Electronics Show in January. Through the collaborative process, students will develop their teamwork and leadership skills, practice writing with clarity, and obtain valuable STEM skills, all in the context of a real-world assignment. I don't know why I have my fist up there. It is not a militant project in any regard. <laughs> now, as items that actually give us authentic purpose, where we're seeing something happen, we're putting something on the market, I would love to see more of this in school. And I think that it's a great way for us to develop skills. Nobody can say, oh, well, you're not meeting standards or you're not um, learning enough through doing that. I mean, you would be writing, you would be marketing, you would be actually seeing how business works in a real context. I see this as the new project-based learning. Because the problem with most of the projects that my peers and I have in school, while projects are sure better than bubbling in answers, it's still only one person or teacher is going to see what we do. And it's usually done. After you submit the project, you kind of forget about it. Maybe you still tell stories about how late you stayed up on the last night of the project, but aside from that, a lot of the impact has just vanished on the day that you get graded. My sister once did a project in her ninth grade, Honors World History class, and it was to make a 3D model of India to learn about geography and culture. So she spent several hours painstakingly shaping this model out of clay and putting in little blue beads to represent the Ganges River and writing um, a little paper to accompany that. Now, we actually had the chance to go to India last year. And guess what? My sister didn't remember much, really any, of the geographical knowledge that she was supposed to obtain from this project that took several hours to make and to submit. And even when projects seem a little better designed than that clay model of India, like for instance having students produce documentaries, again, it may be only one person watching and judging it with little lasting effect after the project is over. So again, we can change this. There are some excellent examples of how the internet is empowering young people like me to do good in our communities and in our world. With the right tools, students, instead of saying things like LOL and OMG on Facebook, can go on to organize a conference. Um, raise your hand if you're familiar with the TED conference. Great. A lot of TED uh, fans are crazy. So TEDx Redmond is an independently organized version, and it's organized entirely by youth. Our committee of 20 teenagers is responsible for putting on this conference for over 700 people every year. And we've done it successfully for two years now. And I think that this really goes to show what young people can do when we have the right tools. But the sad thing is that this is outside of school. This, was, this wasn't really something that a principal was like, hey, you know, it would be a great idea for students to come with a conference. And 
Even when we brought the project to schools and asked them to share it with their students, a lot of times there was resistance. And this is something that I wonder why, when we see a great example of students using the internet to do good, is there this resistance and lack of participation? And that's something that I hope to change. TEDx Redmond is a perfect example of how the tools we have available can enable us to do good. We used everything, Google Docs, Wikis, Skype, blogs, PD Works, um, you know, it was really using pretty much every known brand of the internet. And it really goes to show that kids plus technology doesn't have to equal a name chatter. It can really mean something valuable like this. Another way to give students purpose and allow us to have an impact in the world while learning is encouraging students to share our skills with others. At the beginning of my talk, I mentioned how being a young old master is somewhat incongruous. Young people teaching probably isn't the first image that comes to mind when you think of a teacher. Again, this is something that it would be amazing to change because I know so many young people who are going out and speaking, teaching, and it can be with something as simple as a webcam and a microphone. I do it with video conferencing. I record it and post it on my YouTube teaching channel. Currently, I have hundreds of these videos which are available for anyone to watch. Through this, I'm able to watch my own teaching and evaluate myself, understand how I can engage students better next time, what I can do to improve my teaching practice and engage the students that I'm working with. I see this as one of the best things about the ease of content creation today. Sure, being able to easily upload videos to YouTube might have also enabled Rebecca Black and Friday. How many of you have seen that? Okay, so Rebecca Black's Friday, again, oh, this is a must for youth digital culture. Um, it received more views on YouTube than the Super Bowl did on TV, so that should be enough. It's basically a girl singing a really, really bad auto-tune song, but it's more than that. You don't uh, have to watch it. <laughs> now, I may not have as many views on my teaching videos as Rebecca Black got for Friday, but I think that a few comments saying this was so helpful beats a few million dislikes on YouTube any day of views. But Rebecca Black sadly got. Now, you might think that I'm an exceptional student or that I'm just one among many, but I know many of my classmates would love to have the opportunity to do something like this, to share skills with others, to share something they do really well with other people who need help in that regard. The students at mathtrain.tv are doing it with math, and I have some competition on the writing front because Eva Reidenhauer is, is an eight-year-old who's absolutely adorable, and she's talking about making a novel. This is Cameron Manor, discussing science. Cameron Manor, and today we are going to talk about germs. Hand germs, scissors, and chip. Experience. 
As I said earlier, I'm really not exceptional. I'm not the only student who is doing thinking about my school and the way it's run. There are lots of other students who are also considering this. There are parents, too. Parents have started things like um, ParentRevolution.org, a committee of parents in California. We've heard from administrators, teachers, consultants, politicians, parents. But the one key voice that I've seen missing over and over again, thankfully not here at AESD, you guys are wonderful, but almost everywhere else, is the voice of students. And we're the ones who go and sit in the classroom chairs seven hours a day, and you would think that maybe we would have something to say about the education that we are going through for 12 years. Students have the insights to have meaningful opinions about the education uh, that we're experiencing directly. I started a group called the Student Union on Facebook to really cultivate some of these voices around education reform. Now, I'm really proud of the diversity of our group. We have international students. We have students who are in honor society and have 4.0 GPAs. And we have students who have taken remedial classes and have struggled throughout school. So we really cultivate, again, a variety of opinions across many different schools. And you can see from some of the answers to questions, like where do you go to school? What do you see as some of the uh, pros and cons of it, the weaknesses and benefits? Um, someone said that, unfortunately, the unbalanced and individual goals and perspectives among the whole contributes to the difficulties of specific learn learning for individuals like myself. It's difficult to ask specific questions or pursue specific fields to the end because they're not majority interest. And maybe that's one of the reasons I'm looking forward to college. In the end, I feel like being enrolled in public school provides a base off of which to build different interests. Expanding those interests, however, proves difficult given the standard quantized nature of education for the public. This is a 15-year-old student. And I think it's ideas like this that can really be shared on a larger scale. I definitely invite all of you to join the group and listen and learn from the students. This is, um, Irene said, what is a teacher? Post your answer in the comments section. I really love what Hannah said. This is how I like to think of it. A teacher is somebody who is walking on a path, seeking understanding. A student comes along and asks which way to go. The teacher points down the path and they walk together. A lot of people assume the teacher is already at the end of the road, but I like to think that the road doesn't end. Who would think that you could get these ideas from a group of 10th grade students if you just looked at, you know, maybe an assembly or a bunch of kids on phones and you're thinking, oh, these hooligans are slacking off. Maybe you think otherwise um, when you see kids on phones. But it's really, this can be amazing when students get together and think about education in an intellectual way and really using our own experiences that are fresh in our minds, we can have lasting change. That's what I hope, because the more educators that join the group and listen to these opinions, and really share ideas with students about how we can put some of our ideas for positive change into action, I think the stronger the group can become. Through the student union, I'm hoping to add student voices to the chorus calling for various kinds of education reform because only when we hear from this essential, the essential customers of education can we really get the best ideas for how to move ahead in the new school model. We've heard really incredible things from students across the nation and across the world uh, this is just something, oh, another thing Hannah said actually about history and maybe having a more global outlook, a more balanced outlook, and more across the globe interaction. Maya is saying that we need history to come alive and be more about the human story as opposed to dates and facts that need to be memorized, being taught more interactively. And Ethan talked about science and how we need to have incredible experiments to demonstrate nearly everything. These are the sorts of ideas that I think can be valuable as we move ahead in changing education. There were also some great answers around what is being done right in education. And a majority of the answers to what is being done right in education were students saying, I love the wide variety of courses that my school offers. You can take carpentry, you can take arts, you can take music, you know, you can really take anything. And I think that that really goes to prove a point of Dr. Yong Chao that we shouldn't narrow the curriculum for the sake of test scores because choice is one of the best things for students to satisfy their natural curiosity in learning. The power of the student union really comes from the fact that it's authentic. Students write and run the group, and the role of adults in the group is mainly listening to the opinions that students are voicing. So we've managed to turn the tables a little bit from what it's usually in an education system. And the same methods can really work well for adults reaching out to young people. When we look at social networking, we usually think, oh, it's just students having a good time, you know, socializing. But again, when teachers, when educators, when educational service districts, when schools, when stakeholders in education reach out directly to students, not using the same methods that you use with our parents, it can be incredibly effective. 
How many of you are familiar with Invisible Children's Coney 2012? Is anyone familiar with that? Raise your hands. Okay, I've seen some raised hands. So it was the video that just spread instantly on social networks and went viral. Over one night, it got um, millions of views, and I saw it plaster across my newsfeed. This is a perfect example of the potential that there is for education, I think, using these online tools. If we can make learning happen in as viral and enjoyable a way as we see things happening on social networking, phenomenons like Coney 2012, then we can really mobilize huge student involvement and interaction with our learning. I'm seeing a lot of that stereotypical teenage apathy disappear when we're given the chance to use the tools we have at our, dispos at our disposal to really make change. Yet despite this great possibility that I see existing for schools to connect with us, Many schools have fairly restrictive technology rules in place. Raise your hand if the majority of schools that you work with have some kind of filters. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of raised hands. Okay. So most of the schools that I visited or um, the schools that I attend have filters in place. Sometimes they can be fairly loose, like you can access email and YouTube and stuff like that. Or sometimes they can be extremely tight, where you can only access websites on the approved list. So it really depends. But to me, this approach is a somewhat short-term one. Because now some of you might have heard the crossing the street analogy. If you never let a child cross the street, then how will they know how to do it when they reach adulthood? Or another way to think of it is the touch of the stove approach. When I was little, around three years old, my mom could never stop me from begging, I want to touch the stove, I want to touch the stove. I don't know why I had that desire. I guess there was something hypnotic about the burner. Anyhow, my mom had no luck persuading me. So she said, okay, you can touch the stove, put it on very low setting course, and I went ahead and I touched it, and I didn't get burned, but I did not want to do that again. And I think in the same way, we can give our students the chance to explore the internet using the right tools of having education in place, really a more long-term model. My parents allowed my sister and I to upload videos of us dancing, crazy, lip syncing, everything. It was pretty bad. Like When I look at it back now, I'm really embarrassed being a teenager. But I'm glad that my parents allowed me to do that. It was the touch the stove approach. Having to change all these video settings to private because I'm embarrassed about my friends seeing them now, I'm not going to do something worse in front of a camera during spring break in college. <laughs> touch the stove approach. <laughs> now, if schools would really trust students a little bit more with internet use, as far as allowing us to use the tools that are really useful, and taking a more educational approach about evaluating sources for their credibility and for their usefulness, I think that we can do a lot better. And I remember in my art history class, we were one time, uh, I think our teacher was searching for like Polynesian traditional dance. We were learning about Pacific uh, Island cultures. And the first thumbnail that popped up was not a good one. It was someone's naked posterior, not in a bad context, just in the uh, dance context. And uh, that window got closed immediately. And it was like, oh my gosh, look at this. This is the heart of some of the internet. And I felt like, Wow, you know, this is a great example of how teachers are incredibly scared of all the possibilities out there, even though we're a fairly mature group of students and we can probably handle um, the stuff on YouTube. But I think that there's an incredible area here. Sure, there's risk, but wherever there's risk, there's also amazing possibility. So there are teachers like Esther Wojcicki, who uses the internet very frequently in her classroom, teaches students to, again, evaluate sources critically, really focuses on education as an amazing method to make sure students don't do what they're not supposed to do on the web. And she, uh, her school has five publications, some magazines and a full-length newspaper that is printed out. And students are writing these opinion pieces which get posted on the website. And I'm seeing a lot of amazing discussions happen here. And this is, again, that long-term approach. But I don't think that the skill of evaluating sources critically and really looking at the internet as a place of possibility, I don't think that these skills should be limited to a student journalism class in one high school in Palo Alto. I think that there are ideas, that there are skills I would love to see everywhere. In my own experience, having a blog from a young age was key to improving my learning. Knowing that an audience wider than one person or a group of classmates would be seeing my writing made me think carefully about everything I wrote, about using correct grammar and punctuation, which I know it's not super effective when a teacher is just like, use correct grammar and punctuation. Well, why? It's only one person, whereas when it's 100, 1,000, you definitely worry a lot more about the image you're creating with your writing. So in some ways, it was positive peer pressure. 
Now, for schools that are worried about privacy, there's always options to restrict it to a school so that only students can comment on each other's writing. I think even that is better than just having the audience of one. Most people would be a little wary of letting a five-year-old explore the web, but the internet was crucial to my learning in early childhood. My parents were extremely open on internet use. I got to set up my email account when I was five years old, which I'm guessing is probably not legal, but it was, um, it was monitored by my parents, of course, and I usually just would write emails to my grandma, so it was a very nice, innocuous use of email. We could browse the internet and play educational games on BBC and PBS, and it really helped us broaden our understanding and our curiosity. When I look back on my early education, and I compare my experiences, with homeschooling and with learning online to those of my peers, I realized that I was lucky to have such open-minded parents. My mom and dad believed that investing children, even as young as we were, with the responsibility to make the right decisions and to share our work with the world would make us have a greater sense of responsibility and investment in the work that we did. Knowing that it would be shared with a wider audience definitely helped me as a writer and my sister as well. In some families, and I know most schools, there isn't this openness around internet use. So we have the tools at our disposal, waiting and ready to go. You can tell from the visual beside me that the new school isn't any longer a monolithic experience, one where every student goes through the same process. It's a patchwork of many different opportunities, experiences, people, relationships, online and off. But as we think about the new school, I want to ask you, which of these looks most like your average, everyday school here in the present? A, raise your hand if you think the average school looks more like A. Okay. Raise your hand if you think the average school looks more like B. Raise your hand if you think that the average school looks more like C. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of raised hands. The problem is, C is a school. It's an image of a hallway at the Robben Island prison in South Africa. <laughs> The same one where Nelson Mandela spent over 20 years in captivity. When the schools we go to every day look more like prisons than libraries or cathedrals, I think we have a problem. And it's not just looks. A prison imprisons people. The old school model imprisons learning. Treating learning like it's only something that we can do five days a week, seven hours a day from one person doesn't make sense. Now we have so many sources of learning, the ability to liberate learning from four walls and a whiteboard. Creating lifelong learners starts with the understanding that our world is the best classroom of all. Teachers can come from all places and be all ages. They can be people like the tutors I was privileged to have growing up or the teachers I have in my classrooms today. They can be young people like Eva Reidenhauer and Cameron Manor who have a camera and a microphone and internet access. They can be people like Saul Khan. Raise your hand if you're familiar with Khan Academy. Seeing a lot of raised hands. Khan Academy, where one person, the former investment banker turned teacher to the world, has made over 3,100 teaching videos about everything from calculus to the French Revolution. So when I think of the ideal new school, I ask questions. What if instead of prisons, schools were more like libraries, open spaces acting as portals to knowledge and discovery? And more like cathedrals, not in the religious sense, but rather in inspiring the students to look upward, to reach higher in their learning, to have a greater meaning and purpose in everything they do. Realizing the power and potential of harnessing youth digital culture for educational purposes. Seeking students' perspectives on education issues. And ensuring that everything we learn has authentic purpose. These are the actions we all need to take to journey on the road ahead for the student of tomorrow, the title of my speech. I only have two years in high school left, but the urgency of these actions, it doesn't really come from the fact that I'm going to graduate soon. It comes from the fact that there are millions of kids, like my baby cousins or your kids and grandchildren, who will be students in the years to come. Thank you. appreciation for the superb message. That was truly great. Um, if we could prepare a million uh, adoras in the state of Washington, our future would 
truly be bright. Uh, so that would be our hope. Uh, Adora has brought additional copies of her book, uh, her, her books, and she'll be available to sign those for you. I think they're set up in the back. Yes. So uh, at the end, when we adjourn tonight, if you'd like a copy of her book, and she would be glad to sign them for you. So uh, thank you again very much. It was wonderful.